adults like to characterize Gen Z as an apathetic generation and we don't care about social issues and we're just on our phones all day. But in actuality, Gen Zers, especially black organizers and activists right now are using social media to organize millions of people all around the world for this cause that we're fighting for, which is black liberation. And previous generations have failed us and have failed this country. And Gen Z is not going to wait anymore. We, we don't have the luxury to wait anymore because our lives are depending on our actions. My name is Nupal Kiazolu. I'm 20 years old and I'm the president of Black Lives Matter Greater New York and founder and CEO of my national campaign, Vote 2000. I've been an activist and organizer since the age of 12 years old. So I've been in the game for eight years. I like to call myself a young veteran. Sometimes I feel much older than I actually am, but I've been a part of many different activist organizations. And as a child, I was always very intuitive, always super, super articulate and outspoken. And a lot of times it used to get me in trouble when I was younger because I just did not shut up. So, and my mom would even tell me, like I used to read the newspapers and I'd be telling my mom about the current events that's in a newspaper at five years old. So I've always been like very political even before I knew what it meant to be political. New details in the investigation into the shooting death of Florida teen Trayvon Martin. The 17-year-old died from a single gunshot wound to the chest, fired from intermediate range, according to an autopsy report reviewed by NBC News. The FBI is gathering information and evidence as part of a civil rights probe to find out whether or not Martin was shot by George Zimmerman because he was black. So Trayvon Martin's case definitely wasn't the first incidence of police brutality that I've heard of or I saw on camera. But at 12 years old, I was starting to be able to understand what that actually meant. And when I saw Trayvon Martin's case and what George Zimmerman did to him, it was absolutely inhumane and I was angry. And I couldn't fully articulate how I felt at the time, but I knew that I was angry and I had to do something. And that's when I came up with the idea of holding a silent protest at my middle school and I came to school with my hoodie on and a message tape to my back, do I look suspicious? And eventually I ended up being written up ironically by my history teacher. And the only ally I had throughout that time was my math teacher. And this woman literally risked her job by marching down to the principal's office with me in solidarity with her hoodie on. And we debated back and forth with the principal for a few hours. And instead of suspending me, my principal had me go home and have my case ready for him tomorrow. I looked up my First Amendment rights and then I came across the case Tinker versus Des Moines, which in short is a Supreme Court court case that established the right for students to peacefully organize within school grounds. And that was the focal point of my argument the following day when we went right back to the principal's office in the morning. And I ended up winning the case. And when my teacher and I went to the cafeteria to get lunch, Literally every single student in there had their hoodies on with the same exact message. And my teacher and I just stood there and cried. And that's when I knew that being an activist and organizer was my calling. We need to live. We need to live. My brothers need to live. My sisters need to live. The common things that I faced is misogyny and ageism and obviously racism uh, from other white counterparts that happen to have been a part of those social justice organizations and it was definitely frustrating up until I came in contact with Black Lives Matter Greater New York in 2016. And I definitely didn't walk into the organization looking for any titles. I just wanted to do the work and be respected. And when I met the, uh, the former president, his name is Hulk Newsom, he immediately saw the potential in me and really helped me amplify my voice in the work that I do. The entirety of the seven hours that we were driving down there to Charlottesville, Virginia, every thought was running through my mind. I'm like, what if I'm killed? What if I'm arrested in a state that I'm not from? 
it was just so much anxiety. And a lot of people ask, what did you tell your mother at the time? And what I told my mom is I went, I was going down to Charlottesville to protest against white supremacy, but I didn't tell her that the KKK or neo-Nazis would be there because I didn't want to scare her. And I'd already made up my mind. I, I had a feeling in my heart that things weren't gonna go as well as we hoped for them to go considering the circumstances. Like I didn't expect for anybody to be killed that day and for dozens of people to be injured, including me. I did not expect for it to get as bad as it did. Watch out! I never thought that I'd have to come face to face with a neo-Nazi or a KKK member fully roped. But that's the reality of our country. And our country likes to portray itself as this post-racial utopia. But Charlottesville is the perfect modern day example amongst a plethora of other modern examples that we are not where we are supposed to be. We're not even close. And that's because we have not even come to the point where we've acknowledged that. Like America has literally put a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. Racism is a gunshot wound that's consistently bleeding out. And the only thing that America is doing is putting a Band-Aid over it. Then they're like, oh, this is not who we are as a country. But I would argue this is who we are. This is who this country is. And until we begin to acknowledge that and what racism actually is, then we're not going to get anywhere. And we're going to continue to go in this cycle. Because we're in the digital age and we're, we have phones that are able to record incidents of police brutality. And a lot of times they do go viral. And when people keep seeing instances of black death and brutal, police brutality over and over and over again, it kind of becomes the new norm. And a lot of people have been desensitized to seeing police brutality videos. But I believe that we have to be more intentional in terms of how we circulate these videos throughout the media. And it can also, and it is very traumatic to watch Black Death on camera and it be retweeted and reposted millions and millions of times. And Black people should not have to be murdered on camera and brutally beaten on camera in order for people to recognize that it's a problem. What I would say to young people all around the world that want to be an activist and want to be a part of this movement towards change is that it's never a wrong time to stand up for what's right first and foremost and your voice matters don't let anybody try to tell you otherwise there are so many people that try to stop me and what i have to say because they're like you're a young black girl from the hood what do you have to say listen like i can do this and overall it doesn't matter where you come from whatever walk of life that you may be in right now, you can effectuate change and your voice matters. I came up with the idea in 2017 of Vote 2000 when I held a voter registration drive at my campus and I had to get all four schools on board to bring their graduating seniors down to the library to get them registered to vote. And a lot of them were really irritated because they're like, why do we have to do this? And then somebody said something that struck a chord in me. They said, we already voted for the president. And when I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, people don't really realize how much local politics actually matter. So that's why I was like, I'm gonna come up with this idea, vote 2000. It appeals to Gen Z. I'm a Gen Zer. I was born in 2000 and we're one of the largest new voting blocks in this country. So um, in 2018, I was blessed with the opportunity to team up with DoSomething.org. And in partnership with DoSomething.org, we were able to get over 100,000 young people registered to vote. And I was just so, so proud of that. And right after undergrad, I'm going to law school and I'm going to run for the 9th Congressional District, which is my district right in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And then afterwards, going to go right run for office in 2036 for president.
as a young black activist and organizer that's been doing this for eight years now, a lot of people would ask me before, who are you fighting for? Why are you fighting? And I would always respond for future generations of young black people so they don't have to experience the things that I've experienced today. I didn't think that I'd see this much activation, organizing and change within my lifetime. And if you would have told me this three months ago, that this many people all around the world would come together in the name of black liberation, equity and justice, I would have called you insane. I just didn't see it. I was fighting towards it. I was hoping that my kids' kids could see it, but I didn't think that I would see it. And now that I can confidently say, and sometimes I get emotional when I say it, that I'm not just fighting for the future, but I'm also now fighting for the present. And that's what's most inspiring to me right now about our generation, that fighting spirit within Gen Z, that we're not gonna wait and we're not gonna ask politely, we're taking it. We're taking our lives back, we're taking our futures back, and we're taking our present back.